1864 came to an end. A bitter winter had settled over the South. Bitter in more ways than one. The Civil War was mercifully entering its final agonizing phases. The understrained army of William Tecumseh Sherman, having blasted and pillaged its way through Savannah, Georgia, was now continuing its bloody swing north through the Carolinas. Many of Sherman's campaigns, though planned in a military sense, had raged out of control, with devastating effects on the civilian populace. The South, of course, would never forget to this day. At the same time, another campaign was being planned. This one by a single man in Cleveland, Ohio. This man had purchased his way out of the draft. He was only 25, but he was carefully preparing to spring a trap. And his trap would prove as deadly in an economic sense as Sherman's was in a military sense. John Davidson Rockefeller's trap would succeed. He would capture his prize, a business controlled by his partners, and the result would ultimately prove as consequential to the American economy as Sherman's march through Georgia was to the future of the South. Rockefeller's partners were a chemist named Samuel Andrews, a decent sort, and three brothers named Clark. The Clark brothers were boisterous, rowdy, hard-drinking, hard-swearing womanizers. A great fit for the wildcat drillers in the newly discovered oil fields of Titusville, Pennsylvania. But a bad fit for the abstemious Baptist Sunday school teacher named Rockefeller, who was their partner. And the partnership was not in the drilling business. It was in the refining business. Rockefeller abhorred the Clark brothers. They had been a necessity to capitalize a fledgling refining business that Andrews, Rockefeller, and one of the brothers had founded. Andrews had founded it actually while working in a lard oil factory where he had learned to refine kerosene from petroleum using sulfuric acid. But the Clark brothers' business philosophy was as divergent from that of Rockefeller as was their lifestyle. Rockefeller had sublime faith in the long-term future of the oil business. He was willing to gamble on that and to undertake significant financial risks through bank borrowings in order to expand refining capacity. The Clarks were not. There was a wildcatter philosophy that pervaded the Clark brothers. And what did that lead to? Well, of course, it led to the desire not to capitalize too heavily, not to borrow too heavily. And they had good cause. The price of oil had fluctuated dramatically with each major discovery, so much so that the price had ranged from 10 cents a barrel to $10 a barrel in just the year 1861 alone. And between $4 and $12 a barrel in the year 1864, Rockefeller was quiet, shrewd, calculating, spending great amounts of time on the books of the business and on banking relations. The Clarks were loud and impulsive, outside men by nature, and often given to outbursts of anger. Rockefeller knew it was time to get them out, he prepared secretively and quietly for the climactic moment. First, he convinced his partner Andrews, the chemist, that a split was necessary. Then, he lined up the banks for the inevitable buyout he knew he would have to forge. Now, the banks had come to trust Rockefeller for his conservative but deliberate and honest business practices. Mind you, he's only 25 years old. Though he borrowed extensively to expand, he always kept sufficient reserves to cover outstanding bank debts and payables. And they admired his acumen in positioning the refinery with access to two sources of transportation, the Cahaga River leading to Lake Erie and the Atlantic and Great Western Railroad, which led directly to the oil fields of Pennsylvania and on to New York City. Proximity to more than one source of transportation was a major guidepost to Rockefeller throughout the business career, an important key to his success. Early in his career, before Rockefeller ventured into the oil business, Rockefeller and Clark had just begun the business of buying, selling, warehousing, and shipping farm produce. Rockefeller, at the time barely 20 years old, was approached by a customer promising huge profits if he would simply pay for the man's produce before it arrived at the warehouse. Now, this would deviate from the young firm's business practice, but the potential profits were immense for the struggling neophyte business. Rockefeller politely refused, 
the customer became insistent. Rockefeller maintained his calm and remained steadfast but civil in his refusal, despite the customer's increasing hostility and notwithstanding his fierce ranting and raving as the interview continued. Rockefeller did his best to placate the man, but was convinced as the customer stormed out that he had lost a valuable piece of business. The customer, it turned out, was a professional actor who had been hired by a bank to test Rockefeller's soundness. The actor had played his role to the hilt, and Rockefeller passed the test with flying colors. He would thereafter maintain the confidence of the banks with whom he had now formed a close alliance. He would need every bit of their support in his upcoming confrontation with the Clark brothers. Rockefeller was now ready to spring his trap. It happened on February 1, 1865, and it happened like this. The Clark brothers had often threatened to dissolve the partnership. Dissolution in those days required the consent of all of the partners. But in Ohio, unanimous oral assent of the partners was sufficient for dissolution. Written consent was not necessary so long as notice was given to the public. Rockefeller invited all the partners to his home on February 1, 1865, and then launched into a dissertation on why the partnership should borrow substantially more money to expand. He knew that borrowing capital to expand was anathema to the Clark brothers. As if on cue, the Clarks vehemently disagreed and threatened to dissolve the partnership. We'd better split up, Maurice Clark declared. To his astonishment, Rockefeller not only agreed, but quickly obtained the consent of everyone present. Before the Clarks realized what had happened, Rockefeller had rushed down to the offices of the Cleveland Leader, then a major newspaper in Cleveland, and published a legal notice advising the public of the dissolution. The stunned Clark brothers had no choice but to agree that an auction would have to be held, awarding the firm to the highest bidder. At the appointed time, the Clarks brought their lawyer to the auction. Rockefeller came alone. So the lawyer acted as auctioneer. The bidding started at $500, but it quickly rose into the thousands. Then, in very slow stages, it climbed to $50,000. Rockefeller realized this was already far more than the business was worth, but he kept bidding against the much wealthier Clarks, who had now ratcheted their bid up to $60,000, and were confident that their unimpressive bookkeeper would cease bidding out of sheer nervous strain and lack of financial backing. But Rockefeller was not to be intimidated. Early on in years, he exhibited a trait that would stand him in good stead for the rest of his life. He became calmer as others became more agitated. And so he continued as the stakes went up. Now they ratcheted up to $70,000, far in excess of what the business was worth. Rockefeller knew it. The Clarks knew it but it was now a test of wills, and they were eyeball to eyeball. Finally, the Clarks bid 72,000. Rockefeller countered with 72,500. Maurice Clark blinked, threw up his hands. I'll go no higher, John, he said. The business is yours. Rockefeller calmly countered. And shall I give you a check? Clark reportedly responded, no, I'm glad to trust you to settle at your convenience. On February 15, 1865, the same Cleveland leader carried another legal notice. This one announcing that the co-partnership of Andrews Clark and Company, having purchased by John D. Rockefeller and Samuel Andrews, would henceforth be known as Rockefeller and Andrews Excelsior Oil Works. Rockefeller often referred to the auction as the most critical day of his life and his start on the road to success. He once said to writer biographer Wallace O. Ingalls, I felt the bigness of it, but I was as calm as I am talking to you here now. There lies a significant insight into a man who within the next three decades was to become the wealthiest man in the world. Well, Rockefeller was only 25 when all this took place. Although he knew full well that he had grossly overpaid, he was now in control of Cleveland's largest refinery, one which could process 500 barrels of crude oil daily. This was far greater than the refining capacity of any rival, and therefore ranked as the world's largest oil refinery. 
Rockefeller had successfully avoided serving in the war that was rapidly coming to an end. He had done so paying the requisite $300, notwithstanding the fact that he was a staunch abolitionist. But he was the sole support of his family. He had five siblings. We'll get to that in a bit. In April 1865, however, as Lee and Grant met at the courthouse in Appomattox to negotiate an end to the bloodiest American conflict ever, John D. Rockefeller was now poised to launch one of the most meteoric and momentous business careers in U.S. economic history. We'll return to Rockefeller and Andrews, but first let's back up a bit and examine how this 25-year-old wunderkind came to be. How had a 25-year-old acquired this astonishing business prowess and acumen? Did he perhaps come from a long line of great achievers, people of great wealth? Who are the forebears of this phenomenon who would go on to become the wealthiest man in America? Well, Rockefeller's father, William Avery Rockefeller, was born in Granger, New York in 1810. He was a man of many characteristics, but sterling character was not one of them. He was a man of disguises who would often leave his family for long stretches of time. William was a large man physically, well proportioned and strong. So early on in life, he was nicknamed Big Bill, and the name stuck. Perhaps his most common disguise was that of a flim-flam man. Or in words of the vernacular, ironically, John D. Rockefeller was the son of a snake oil salesman. Every so often, Big Bill would return from the road in triumph his pockets bulging with cash, much to the relief of his petrified family on such occasions, would finally pay off the family debts to the local general store. And remember, in those days, if you didn't pay your debts, you went to debtor's prison. As a result of this nightmarish pattern, John's mother, Eliza, lived in constant dread that her credit would be canceled. She feared the family would starve to death or freeze in the winter in upstate New York in the frontier towns they lived in called Richford, Moravia where Big Bill had settled them. No one knew where he got his money. Although certain things were known about Big Bill, many more were rumored. It was known, for example, that he had once been a lumberman traveling in Canada to bring in wood, mostly walnut and ash wood, and sell it at handsome profit to lumber mills. He had indeed been to Canada, but while in Canada, he had also established himself as an entirely new personality styling himself, quote, Dr. Livingston, a traveling doctor who could cure cancer. Apparently, he peddled a number of so-called patent medicines, cure-alls. Prophetically, one was known as rock oil, a black, shiny liquid substance that oozed from the ground in places like Titusville, Pennsylvania, was scooped up with rags, bottled and sold as patent medicine. They didn't know what to do with it. And ironically, John D. Rockefeller's father was selling it as patent medicine. When Big Bill finally moved his wife and children to Strongsville, Ohio, which is just outside of Cleveland, he had adopted just such a guise, styling himself as a botanic physician. By sheer happenstance, a Strongsville neighbor, Bill Webster, while checking into a hotel in Richfield, was flabbergasted to confront the following sign prominently displayed in the lobby. Quote, Dr. William Rockefeller, the celebrated cancer specialist, here for one day only. All cases of cancer cured unless too far gone and then can be greatly benefited, end quote. Webster was intrigued and venturing out at the appointed place and time, spotted his neighbor Big Bill perched on top of a buggy with the same sign resting against the wheels. He was dressed to kill with a top silk hat, a brocaded vest, and a long black frock, and he was sporting a long dark red beard. The striking figure had attracted a large crowd and was selling his patent remedies at $25 a bottle. No small sum in those days. But rest assured, for those who couldn't afford, 25 Well, he'd make a special exception. Available only today. Buy smaller quantities, but whatever they could reasonably afford was okay, so long as it was in cash. Dr. Rockefeller would only be there for one day, so he had better stock up now. No telling where he would return, as he was in such demand. Webster wasn't a shy man. He approached his neighbor and asked him, What in some hell do you think you're doing? Big Bill, never one to shrink from an affront, calmly responded that he had been doing some doctoring lately and had, in fact, traveled as far away as Iowa, 
with his roadshow, was even investing in land with some of his profits. Well, William had uprooted his family many times, moving them from Richfield to Moravia and then to a town called Owego on the Pennsylvania border. Why Owego? Well, the rumor had it that Big Bill needed to live close to the border. So if necessary, he could make a hasty escape over the border. There were many theories. At the time, Big Bill's closest friends were one Caleb Palmer, Charlie Tidd, and a man named Bates. All these were arrested, charged with stealing horses, and convicted after one of them, Caleb Palmer, turned state's evidence and implicated the other two. Although no one ever officially connected Big Bill to the clandestine activities of his three best friends, John Dee's critical biographer, Ida Tarbell, revealed that it was alleged by Palmer's son, but never formally proven in court, that Bill was really the mastermind behind the notorious ring of horse thieves, but that he was too smart to be caught, and that Bill had left his buddies Palmer, Tid, and Bates behind to twist in the wind. One incident actually did land Big Bill in court. Bill was a notorious ladies' man. One of the female targets had been one Nancy Brown. She was a tall, attractive Rockefeller bookkeeper in Moravia, and she accused him of rape. And in 1859, filed charges against him in the Auburn County Courthouse about a year later than the alleged incident. As author Ron Chernow points out, Ominously, it was that very year that Nathaniel Hawthorne published The Scarlet Letter. Records of court proceedings thereafter are unclear. What is known is that Bill never appeared in court, that he fled the district but was never hotly pursued by the authorities and eventually moved his family to Owego near the state line. Although John Dee was young at the time, he would hide from his father's disgrace for the rest of his life. As John Dee became older and more successful, Except for the bold critics, such as Ida Tarbell, the subject of his father became increasingly taboo, to be approached at one's peril. Although the records of Big Bill's birth are plentiful, records of his death are virtually non-existent. It is believed that he lived most of the rest of his life in numerous locations, including the Western Dakotas, but with a new, younger wife and family under the assumed name of Levingston that he died in Philadelphia at age 96, and that John secretively visited him in the hospital there on one occasion and actually met his wife for the first and only time. The entire story is clouded in mystery to this day. Well, what kind of a woman would put up with this, and what was the effect of this strange marital relationship on the 25-year-old John D. Rockefeller, who in 1864 we found at the fulcrum of an auction for the largest existing refinery in the country. Eliza Davison Rockefeller was Big Bill's diametric opposite. She was as puritanical and spartan as Big Bill was hedonistic. She was as self-denying as he was profligate and self-indulgent, as restrained as he was wild and as austere as he was flagrant and bawdy. As Bill's absences increased, she became by default the sole disciplinarian of the six Rockefeller children. Although she was severe in her discipline, often using a birch switch, it was tough love, and the children knew it instinctively. Big Bill's activities outside the household became increasingly shameful. That was a scarlet letter, which she bore stoically. The worst was yet to come. The church helped her bear up. She had become a devout Baptist, and both she and the children were sheltered and guided by Baptist values. John D. Rockefeller's life and work would forever be guided by the Baptist faith and devoted to its teachings and principles. But what then were these, and where did they come from? Slight digression, but a necessary one, for it's impossible to even approach an understanding of John D. Rockefeller without comprehending his profound religious convictions, and the origins of his faith. A while ago, my children presented me with a t-shirt on which was printed a New Yorker cartoon. And it showed two pilgrims on the deck of the Mayflower. And they were talking on their way to Plymouth. One is saying, quote, religious freedom is my immediate goal, but my long-range plan is to go into real estate. 
In his seminal but controversial work titled The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, sociologist historian Max Weber hypothesized that the Protestant Reformation, coupled with a number of other factors, such as the growth of cities that break down the guild system, eventually wrought tectonic shifts in the economic culture of the Western world, changes which were arrived at much later in Asia. By abolishing the monasteries, Luther's Reformation spread religious callings to the rest of the population. Two critical factors manifested themselves. Ordinary occupations supplanted monastic life and assumed the mantle of callings. And asceticism became an inherent fact of Christian life, all leading to an ethos of work, save, maintain self-control, reinvest, and strive for economic success, Protestant ethic. Weber also argues that Calvinists, such as the Puritans, who believed in the doctrine of predestination and of the elected few, actually felt impelled to act precisely because they were predestined to do so. But in fact, on our eastern frontier, in the early 1800s, breakaway sects such as baptism, who were not tied to this doctrine, fared better. The rapid growth of the Baptist church in America was characterized by a number of charismatic leaders. The church founded in the 1600s by the noted Roger Williams of Rhode Island had first begun to spread during a movement called the Great Awakening, which was begun in 1739 by a charismatic English preacher named George Whitfield. Whitfield traversed our eastern seaboard holding prayer sessions often characterized by writhing on the ground, singing, shrieking, ultimate reforming of sinners through total immersion. Whitfield's work was taken up during the first third of the 19th century by another charismatic revivalist named Charles Grandison Finney, whose nightly prayer sessions and those of a preacher colleague named Jacob Knapp often featured hardened sinners sitting on so-called anxious benches until they were moved to repent during vivid, Dante-like depictions of the burning pits of hell and devils with pitchforks forcing sinners back down as they try to crawl out. But a far more important than these frenzied trappings of the movement, which characterized its early growth in this country, were a number of formidable principles that emerged from its practice as life values, and which significantly affected Eliza, and particularly her oldest son, John. In the 1820s and thereafter, the militant evangelist ministers, precisely in the tradition described by Weber in the Protestant ethic, protested against a multiplicity of sins. These included smoking, drinking, dancing, card playing, billiards, and even theater, which they feared was a corrupting influence. It is significant that John D. Rockefeller became a practicing Christian, and not unlike Henry Ford, would abstain from all of these condemned vices, except eventually theater, which he indulged himself, but only in moderation, late in life in the 20th century. But there was a far more important religious nexus to his life than abstinence. The Baptist faith was, among other things, a reaction to the elitism and the hierarchy of Calvinism. Baptist ministers, many of whom rose from the ranks of the poor and the uneducated, were fearless in their forays into the eastern wilderness, to communities and outposts where more established religionists dared not travel. As such, the Baptist faith was much more adaptable to the life of the frontiersmen than was the faith of the Calvinists. Baptism was egalitarian believing that everyone could be saved, not just a select elite. More important, it did not believe in predestination, but stressed free agency. Everyone could better himself by free acts of will. No soul was irrevocably lost. Men could be redeemed. This conviction bred a philosophy of self-reliance and resultantly a belief in the possibility of social uplift. It gave a philosophical mooring to the entrepreneurial spirit of 19th century America. For although the Baptists abhorred ostentation, they did not oppose individual entrepreneurship and the accumulation of wealth, factors critical to the coming of age of John D. Rockefeller, who was a product of that ethos. Moreover, the church awakened in Rockefeller an abiding belief in philanthropy, in the responsibility of man for his less fortunate brethren in society. 
The second awakening had, in the words of Ron Chernow, explicitly linked personal conviction with community reform. Many Northern Baptists, such as Rockefeller and the family of his mother, Eliza Davison, became ardent abolitionists. And they were, in fact, an invaluable link in the Underground Railroad during the Civil War. And the same philosophical concern for the community as a whole established a poignant foundation for giving back, which came to dominate Rockefeller's later years, and which underlay some of the most important philanthropic endeavors of the 20th century. The church helped sustain Eliza as well. Eliza was a simple woman of limited education, often misspelling the most fundamental of words. But she was strong, and she had learned to endure great hardship, raising six children off alone and living on the edge of the wilderness. As time wore on, she came to rely more and more on John Dee. He, in turn, out of necessity, learned to keep meticulous accounts for her, and in doing so, he taught himself the rudiments of bookkeeping to keep the family from overspending during the perilous times when Bill was away. Eliza came from a severe but very sound New England family. She had been bedazzled by handsome, smooth-talking Big Bill Rockefeller and had married him despite her parents' entreaties not to do so. Yet having made her rash decision, she lived with it in an uncomplaining manner, internalizing her mistake and never burdening others. The church taught self-denial. She was a living incarnation of its teaching. Eliza had been a very pretty young woman, but photographs of her in her 40s reveal a rapidly aging and sad-faced woman, thin, almost anorexic, with piercing eyes and a sharp chin. Her unfortunate marriage had taken its toll. But there was an enormous reserve of strength in her small frame. There had to be. Bill's visits have become increasingly infrequent now. For good reason. He was actually raising an entirely new family elsewhere. Margaret Alding Levingston, a woman he had covertly married in Canada, while he was married to Eliza, like Eliza, had no idea that Bill had another family. Nor did she ever suspect, as time wore on, that one of his sons was reputedly the richest man in the world. Margaret Allen Levingston was a very proper society lady, active in the First Presbyterian Church, a prominent member of the Illinois chapter of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Bill Levingston's family is reported to have lived in Illinois for a long time, and time in North Dakota as well. But Big Bill was often away, far away in rural districts, out west, far from sophisticated city audiences, far from the medical profession. He had to be. His business thrived only at great distances from the medical profession. John Dee's knowledge of the details of his father's bigamy remained shrouded in mystery. John Dee is rumored to have met Margaret Allen Levingston once when he visited Big Bill in the hospital. Big Bill was 92 at the time, but Margaret reportedly only learned of his relationship after 50 years of marriage. As Bill lay dying at age 96, apparently he was babbling incoherently, and it all came out. Eliza may never have known of Bill's bigamous relationship, but in the 1850s, as that relationship flowered and his visits became more and more infrequent, John Dee had passed out of boyhood and into manhood almost overnight. He was the eldest of the brood. In the process, he became prematurely wise in the ways of the world. There was never again to be a meaningful influence on his children's lives. John had already become their surrogate father. But there was a gap. Life had never allowed John Dee to experience the joy and exuberance of youth. He just never let go. An 1856 photograph of him as a 20-year-old with his five siblings shows a meticulously dressed mature man with a serious, focused countenance and sharp, piercing eyes, seeming to preside over the entire brood. But there was another dimension to him. Survival under these circumstances had already forced the development of certain unscrupulous traits of cunning that would forever define him, Thurman Arnold traits. John Dee inherited many traits from his stoic mother. Eliza never lost her temper, 
and she bore her burdens with equanimity. So also did John Dee. Following her impetuous infatuation, the resulting disastrous relationship with Big Bill, Eliza would forever view volatile people with suspicion. Her impetuosity had brought her a lifetime of tragedy, and she taught her children the virtues, therefore, of reflection, of calculation, and knowledgeable decision-making, all traits that would inform John Dee's career. When faced with a major decision, John Dee would ape a phrase that his mother often used, let's just let it simmer for a while. Finally, as the wanderings and antics of Big Bill became increasingly outlandish and embarrassing, the family learned the lesson of secrecy. John D. would remain secretive in virtually all things for the rest of his life. Did John then learn nothing from his father at all? Actually, despite Bill's profligate ways and braggadocio, John did learn a number of things from him that stuck with him for a lifetime. One was an inordinate love of money. Bill's life revolved around his quest for money. He exulted in exhibiting large quantities of cash whenever he would return to the household in triumph from his various forays into the competitive world. And since Bill's return was always associated in John's mind with great relief and good times, money was equated with pleasant associations in his mind. Big Bill kept mounds of cash in drawers, never trusting banks. John D. used banks were absolutely necessary, but avoided using the investment bankers on Wall Street in transactions involving Standard Oil wherever possible, a trait inherited from his father. Since the family was necessity frugal during Bill's long absences, John not only learned from his father how to keep meticulous books of account, of expenditure, but how to economize traits he carried with him into the micromanagement of many of his enterprises, especially in his early years. But perhaps most of all, he learned from Bill that the battle of commerce is ruthless and to give no quarter. He learned from Bill that to prevail in the world of business, one had to be both shrewd and relentless, never trusting anyone, particularly your closest friends and your partners. These are traits we'll encounter time and again in this course, traits shared by Fisk, Gould, Tweed, and Henry Ford. When John D. was a very small child, Bill would play a game with him, encouraging John to jump into his outstretched arms and catching him just before he hit the ground, until the child became comfortable making the leap. Then suddenly, on the next leap, Bill would withdraw his waiting arms, allowing the child to fall helplessly to the ground, admonishing him, remember, never trust anyone, even me. The lesson was one Rockefeller would never forget. Big Bill also taught Rockefeller that any means of competition, fair or foul, was permissible so long as you paid your debts promptly and adhered meticulously to carefully drawn written contracts. Quoting Burton Russell, author Ron Chernow, came to the following conclusion about these paradoxical parental phenomena that shaped Rockefeller's career. Bertrand Russell once said of Rockefeller, what he said, what he thought, what he felt, came from his mother. But what he did came from his father, with the addition of a great caution generated by early unpleasantness. The issue is much more complicated than that, but there is no doubt that Rockefeller's achievements arose from the often tense interplay between these two opposing, deeply ingrained tendencies of his nature, his father's daring and his mother's prudence, yoked together under great pressure. Big Bill's secret bigamous relationship now had a profound effect on the career of young Rockefeller. While Rockefeller was in secondary school, 16 years old, Bill informed him that he would now have to leave school and earn money for the family. Rockefeller dutifully terminated his formal education, Central High in Cleveland, and enrolled in a three-month business course at E.G. Folsom's Commercial College in Cleveland. He studied double-entry bookkeeping and other rudimentary aspects of business, and after finishing the short course in the summer of 1855, still age 16, he set out to find a job. It was a bad time to look for work, particularly in Cleveland, Ohio. There had been a nationwide recession in the early 1850s. Cleveland was severely affected and not yet recovered. For six weeks, Rockefeller arose every morning, dressed in his best suit, vest, white shirt and tie, 
and methodically trod the blazing hot streets of Cleveland during the torrid summer. And he visited only businesses that he knew were financially reputable, banks, railroads, and wholesale merchants. All a 16-year-old could offer was a rudimentary knowledge, bookkeeping, but he walked the streets in that manner for six weeks, six days a week, without let up and without one prospect for a job. While others simply walked the streets of Cleveland oblivious, Rockefeller quietly observed. And what he saw intrigued him. Cleveland was a relatively new city. It had a population of 25,000, but it was growing rapidly, and for good reason. In 1830, a canal had been opened linking Cleveland to the Ohio River. And suddenly, Cleveland was becoming a major port city. It was located on the shores of Lake Erie, a deep water port, and thus became part of the linked Great Lakes. Moreover, the westernmost terminus of the Erie Canal was located near enough to Cleveland to make the canal readily accessible. As a result, Cleveland was perfectly situated to facilitate and conduct trade with New York and New England, and to become a shipping center for innumerable commodities from the West, such as iron ore, salt, corn, wheat. All of these could be shipped by barge and rail car from the West into Cleveland, and from there to the world. And Cleveland was ideally situated to facilitate the shipment of coal from the East as well. Finally, on September 26, 1855, after interminable walking and rejections, Rockefeller visited a shipping and warehouse company called Hewitt and Tuttle. They interviewed him in the morning, tested the legibility of his handwriting. In the afternoon, gave him a job and put him to work on the spot. No talk of salary, no talk of the length of employment, or any other condition. Rockefeller didn't even know whether or not he'd been hired as a no-pay apprentice or a salaried worker. Incredibly, he didn't receive a paycheck until three months after he was put to work at Hewitt and Tuttle. He could not afford to work for no pay forever, but there was literally nothing else available in Cleveland. More important, however, Rockefeller realized that the experience he was gaining at Hewitt and Tuttle would be invaluable to him. Hewitt and Tuttle had other bookkeepers. To most of them, their work was Dickensian drudgery. One has visions of young men standing endlessly at neat rows like poor Bob Cratchit, at stand-up desks with quill pens entering long rows of figures on neatly lined paper. Morning to night, six days a week. But not for young John D. Rockefeller. For Rockefeller, the chance to work at Hewitt and Tuttle provided an opportunity to gain insight and finally to master the inner workings of a cleverly conceived multi-transportation system to grasp the intricacies of a series of shipping alternatives, such as rail, ship, and canal, that had enabled this multi-commodity, shipper and warehouseman, to succeed where many of its peers had floundered. In this, his curiosity and his insight were not unlike those of the young tinkerer, Henry Ford, who would eventually master the intricacies of taking apart and reassembling watch mechanisms. Four years went by. By this time, Rockefeller felt that he had learned all that he could from Hewitt and Tuttle, and he knew he was grossly underpaid. He demanded a raise, and when they refused, he left to form a partnership with a student he had befriended at Commercial College, Maurice B. Clark. Consistent with the skill he had acquired from intense observation and increasing responsibilities at Hewitt and Tuttle, Rockefeller partnered with Clark in the purchase, sale, and shipping of farm products such as grain and meat. The new venture required capital. John D. approached Big Bill for a $1,000 loan. Bill accommodated him, charging 10% interest, far more than the then bank rate, knowing that the fledging enterprise could not qualify for bank credit. Rockefeller accepted these terms from his father uncomplainingly, simply assuming that this was common business practice, even between parents and children, that in business everyone was either unscrupulous and unemotional or unsuccessful. Notwithstanding Bill's $1,000 loan, the company was undercapitalized and was forced to seek further private financing. This they received from George Gardner, 
the scion of a prominent Cleveland family. When Gardner joined, Rockefeller's name was immediately dropped from the title as the name Gardner was added. No one knew Rockefeller. The name Gardner was associated in Cleveland with old line money and security. It was an insult that Rockefeller would never forget, but typically he bore it in silence and stoically, and he would bide his time. His time came within two years. During that time, George Gardner proved to be a plague on the fledgling business. He was the antithesis of what Rockefeller admired. Gardner lived extravagantly, spent lavishly. His excesses included a $2,000 yacht, drove Rockefeller and eventually his partners as well to distraction. Rockefeller was trying to impress the banking community with the steadiness and reliability of his enterprise, and he feared that the image of the prodigal son, Gatsman, would destroy their credibility within the financial community. By this time, Rockefeller had joined the Erie Street Baptist Mission Church and had become a Sunday school teacher, an activity which he would engage in for many years on into the 80s, almost the rest of his life. He was now already earning a reputation as a young man, but as a man of his word, repaid his debts on time and adhered carefully to contractual obligations. That he'd gotten from Big Bill. Based upon these practices, Rockefeller had eventually earned a line of bank credit that enabled their new venture to oust the profligate Gardner. In 1862, the company name now again became Clark and Rockefeller, and John D. was 22 years of age. But business developments tend to be dynamic. Markets change. Locations which are valuable during one phase of economic activity can become less valuable during the next phase. And so it was with Cleveland. As Gardner left the business and Rockefeller and Clark were now on their own, the nation's center for grain shipping, meat packing, general produce, warehousing, gradually shifted to the west of Cleveland. Cities such as Chicago, Milwaukee, Omaha had sprung up overnight because of their proximity to the sources of produce and their accessibility to freight. And Rockefeller could see that the future of the produce commission business lay in the western port cities rather than in Cleveland. Ah, but at the same time, the fortunes of fate smiled on the town of Cleveland. Oil had been discovered in nearby Titusville, Pennsylvania, and Cleveland was ideally situated to benefit from its refining and shipping. When Andrews, the chemist, decided to establish his own refinery, Clark was able to convince John D. that the two of them should join him. Again, the newly formed enterprise was undercapitalized, and it was at this point that Clark and Rockefeller were joined by Clark's two rough-hewn brothers, to form Andrews, Clark and Company. Although it was to be Andrews job to oversee the refinery operations, Rockefeller began to immerse himself more and more in its operation, effectively micromanaging savings in myriads of ways. For example, when he was outraged by a plumber's bill, he hired a full-time staff plumber and purchased the needed plumbing materials, affecting great cost savings. One day while riding on a train, Rockefeller noticed an elaborate mansion and inquired as to its owner. Well, he was informed that it belonged to the owner of a barrel making company, which supplied the very barrels Rockefeller was using. Rockefeller concluded that the barrel business must be just too good and immediately established his own barrel making business. When he became aware that the cost of shipping wood was a significant overhead item, he arranged to have only dried wood shipped, thus cutting the weight and drastically reducing the freight cost by as much as a half. When he noticed that a little excess sulfuric acid remained after the refining process, he arranged to have the leftover sulfuric acid converted into fertilizer instead of discarded. But along with these thrifty conservative savings practices, Rockefeller harbored much more radical expansionist aspirations. John Dee's willingness to plunge ever deeper into the refining business at a time when the prices were fluctuating wildly was becoming nightmarish to his Clark partners as were his persistent demands that they borrow more from the banks. There were many other refineries opening up in Cleveland, and the Clark brothers saw only gloom, doom, and bankruptcy in borrowing for expansion at times like these. This then was the bizarre heritage, and these were the defining events which led to the astonishing auction masterminded by the 25-year-old Rockefeller in 1864 with which we began this session. 
an event which he himself characterized as the most significant moment on his road to fortune. On a business level, he had been propelled by a dysfunctional family relationship to prematurely acquire an absolute sense of self-assurance. He was forced to become a strategic planner, cold, calculating, distrusting, and above all, secretive. He was realistic, not prone to make moves on the chessboard of business without a carefully conceived plan. He was highly analytical, by self-definition an observer who kept his eyes open and his mouth shut. As a true product of the present ethic, as described by Weber, he shared his mother Eliza's distrust of ostentation, profligate living, and emotional displays. And he shared with her as well a deep and abiding faith in a religion which simultaneously preached self-denial while encouraging the entrepreneurial spirit and self-betterment. And he combined all of these traits with a keen comprehension of numbers and a sense of daring inherited from his father. As we will see in our session next week, each of these influences and each of these traits significantly impacted the phenomenon that followed as over the next half century, John D. Rockefeller evolves into one of the most admired and one of the most vilified men on the face of the earth. Thank you. Thank you.